did. He went to pre-med training at the University of Michigan, then uh, medical school at Western Reserve University, now Case Western. When uh, the war ended, so did ASTP, but Stoney stayed in the service and completed medical school in 1949. He was posted then to Letterman Army Hospital in San Francisco for a residency in pediatrics. Next slide, please. Next slide. Ah, there we are. Thank you. Uh, on June 25th, 1950, the North Korean People's Army invaded South Korea, and Stoney was called to active duty. He was a detached, or I'm sorry, attached to the medical battalion of the 187th Regimental Combat Team, a unit of the 11th Airborne. He arrived in Korea in fall 1950 and served there until summer 1951. During that time, he kept a journal. He traced his movements on this map. Uh, and kept a patient roster, and he collected other artifacts. Now, it's important for you to know that Stoney was terrified of heights. His journal chronicles days of doubt and fear leading up to each of his four parachute jumps that year. Now, it ended up that he was not seriously injured despite his concerns, but he did manage to break his nose twice. A few things he learned in Korea. He read a lot. Uh, he came back from uh, the service with this collection of Army, uh, I'm sorry, Armed Services Edition books. Uh, these are special editions of uh, books that the Army uh, produced for soldiers. Uh, this satisfied his intellectual curiosity and I'm sure stemmed a lot of boredom. Uh, there are dozens and dozens of these books uh, in our basement right now. Um, during this time in Korea, uh, going in and coming out, and for a little R&R &R in between, uh, he went to Japan, and this led to a lifelong love affair uh, with Japan. Most important, his military service gave him a focus uh, and a toughness of mind that contributed to his later success as a researcher and academic. He learned to manage the emotions of fear and self-doubt as an acrophobic medical officer willed himself to make four parachute jumps, two of them into combat. He recounted an enemy attack in his journal. He wrote, incoming artillery screams and it's completely terrifying. I awoke suddenly one night and couldn't stop shaking for five minutes. He told me later that he decided at that point uh, never to fear anything that couldn't threaten his life. He also told me that the closest he came to that feeling was standing nearby while former uh, UT Board of Regents Chairman Frank Irwin gave a tongue lashing to a poor consulting architect. Next slide, please. There we go. Thanks. Upon return to the U.S., uh, Stoney was sent back to Letterman Hospital, but he found peacetime medicine boring compared with his battlefield experiences. He did, though, treat a lot of communic communicable diseases, uh, and that ignited his curiosity about the nexus between disease pathology and human behavior. He expressed his appreciation for the field this way. He wrote, Communities are as much social as biological entities, and the explanations of disease, uh, uh, disease occurrence in those settings evoke, in one way or another, all aspects of the human condition. All the interactions between people and their physical, biological, and social environments. That's what makes epidemiology so beautiful. The problems are endlessly complex, and everything is related to everything else. He was known for telling students that if it isn't fun, it isn't epidemiology. In 1951, he enrolled in the Masters of Public Health program at UC Berkeley, where he studied epidemiology formally, and he met Bill Reeves, who became a lifelong mentor and friend. After fulfilling his service in 1956, uh, his service commitment, he resigned from the Army and served as professor of epidemiology at Berkeley from 1956 to 1968. Evidently, he was an exacting teacher. One of his doctoral students, Dwayne Reed, recalled, uh, he made you think about what we're doing. I mean, what are the underlying principles of what we do? He was just a pleasure to be around, always stimulating, tough professor, but at the same time delightful. 
Around the same time, uh, my sister Jarrell recalls a long evening. You had to be willing to put in the time at the dinner table as he told the story of the construction of the Panama Canal and the epidemiology of yellow fever. Now, here's where I have to take a knee in relating Stoney's career, especially in this crowd, because if I try to characterize his work in epidemiology and its significance to the field, I'm playing without a net, and I'll be wrong. Uh, I refer you instead to the good articles that Loran and others have written on those topics. I can tell you that he thought a lot in these years about the nature of education in general and public education, uh, public health education specifically. At this time, Stoney's uh, study designed to investigate the links between smoking and heart disease caught the attention of UT official Mickey Lemater. So in 1967, when the Texas legislature finally funded the UT School of Public Health that it authorized 20 years before, Stoney wound up on the short list of candidates for the first permanent dean of the school and accepted the position in early 1968. He told Loran later that the main reason he accepted that uh, the position was that he was given free reign to create the school as he saw fit. And so they began to build it with a pioneering faculty and what he called 42 very pleasant revolutionaries as students. They met first in the Mayfair Hotel. Uh, for some students and faculty, the main draw was the intensely student-directed multidisciplinary curriculum. There were no required courses and no mandated courses of study. Students were expected to work with advisors and design their own pathways to their desired degrees. The school itself was organized in a matrix fashion with faculty assigned to traditional disciplinary clusters, but also to modules, multidisciplinary fields of study that changed as issues and topics in public health changed. The structure was new to the field of public health and drew from the ideas of Carl Rogers and from Stoney's own beliefs about the nature of education. The focus was intensely self-directed learning. An early accreditation report read this way, the organizational character of the school in which problem areas and disciplines intersect reflects what community health in the future is all about. During Stoney's tenure as dean from 1968 to 1986, the school grew from the original 42 students to 468 enrolled uh, and granted a total of 1,719 degrees between 1970 and 1985. The school moved out of the Mayfair Hotel and into another structure and ultimately into the current building, the Rule A. Stalins building, which was specifically built to support the matrix educational philosophy. Floors were assigned to modules with faculty officed there regardless of discipline. The central lounge on each floor was intended to bring people together to mingle and share ideas. The central lounges weren't part of the original building design, however. Carl Camrath was hired to design the structure, and he conceived, conceived it as two parallel towers, one for labs, one for offices, uh, I'm sorry, one for labs and offices, and one for classrooms and library facilities. When the model was first presented to Stoney, however, uh, he turned the towers edge to edge and pressed them together. He asked, can we build it this way? And the central lounges were born. In addition to the organizational and architectural structures, weekly beer busts, seasonal, seasonal shrimp boils, and other expeditions were held to dissolve, dissolve disciplinary silos and dissolve those silos between faculty and students. Today, the School of Public Health has multiple units across Texas, as David shared, and has produced generations of scientists and public health professionals that have improved health outcomes for Americans. And it's all due to Stoney's intellectual curiosity, the independence and risk-taking he learned as a young man and confirmed in war, and his love for the intricate nature of epidemiology and community health. Last slide, please. Finally, Stoney was the consummate teacher. Everybody who knew him can tell stories of being enthralled by his explanation of a particular concept or event. When I was in college, I spent summers with him in his townhouse near the Astrodome, and when he wasn't traveling, 
we would sit at his kitchen table for long rambling talks about life, the Korean War, politics, public health, whatever. I'd love to sit with him one more time to hear his thoughts about the current state of health in the world. After all, uh, as Dwayne Reed called him, uh, Dwayne Reed called him the philosopher, the epidemiologist's epidemiologist. We could use that insightful, focused, creative mind today. Thanks for your attention. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Stallone, uh, for this background in the life of your of your father and the, the School of Public Health. Uh, it's it's an amazing background, and it, I think it's critical to understand our own background and origins uh, in order to look forward. And I think I can speak for all the faculty, the staff, and the students uh, to think that that we are enriched uh, from this from this account of of your father, and really appreciate it. Uh, we'll be uh, having a question and answer session at the at the end of this, and I encourage all those attending to, to feel free to, to have this unique opportunity uh, to to ask the, the Stallones uh, uh, questions that you might have uh, about the school, about about their father. Um, I'm going to go ahead and change gears now. And uh, Dr. Pats, are you on the line? Uh, yes, I am. I was just waving, but yes, uh, can you hear me? Okay, great. Thank you. Yes. Uh, so great. So uh, I'm pleased now for our second part of our, of our lecture series today to introduce uh, Dr. Jonathan Patz. He is a professor and the John P. Holton Chair of Health uh, and Sciences in the Environment with faculty appointments in the Nelson Institute and the Department of Population Health Sciences. He also directs the University of Wisconsin-Madison's Global Health Institute and Dr. Patz has co-chaired the health report for the first congressionally mandated U.S. National Assessment on Climate Change uh, for 15 years and served as lead author for the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And this organization shared the 2007 Nobel Peace Prize with Al Gore. Uh, some of his other awards include an Aldo Leopold Leadership Fellows Award, a shared Zayed International Prize for the Environment, a Fulbright Scholarship, the American Public Health Association's highest award for health leadership. And in October 2019, he was inducted into the National Academy of Medicine. And uh, it's uh, with great privilege that I, that I uh, introduce you to Dr. Patz. And thank you so much for joining us today. Well, thank you for that uh, kind introduction. And uh, I'm very inspired by the, the Stallones and, and what has happened at your school and, and their leadership, Stoney's leadership. Uh, really nice. So it's an honor to uh, give this lecture. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and uh, share my my screen, and uh, you'll should be seeing some PowerPoint slides in just one second here. Uh, let's see if I can. Okay, let me just get my title slide up, and then uh, can you give me a thumb, thumbs up? Uh, every, everything good? You see the title? Looks good. Great. Okay. Thank you. So um, the title, of course, uh, preparing for the climate crisis while also reaping the health benefits from action on climate change on a clean energy future. So again, it's an honor to give this uh, uh, real St uh, Stallone's uh, endowed lecture for you today. Now, uh, it's not your imagination that summers are getting hotter. This is data from uh, Jim Hansen and his group uh, looking at temperatures in the, in the northern hemisphere over time. And notice as we go through time, especially on the right side, the very hot, the, the red color for extremely hot days. So here we go. Average measured temperatures, northern hemisphere 1951 to 80, 83 to 93, 94 to 2004. 2005 to 2015, it is absolutely getting warmer. And look at what we're going to have to be dealing with from the health point of view. So uh, I've been studying this for a long time. It's pretty much my career looking at the health risks of climate change. And when we think about climate change, the three physical attributes are rising temperatures, sea level rise from thermal expansion of salt water, as well as land-based glaciers uh, sliding into the ocean, 
but also uh, extremes of the water cycle, hydrologic extremes, more droughts, floods, and fires. And these have a dramatic impact on our health. Uh, and when you look at the many exposure pathways through which uh, climate change affects our health, uh, each one of these has uh, pretty significant health outcomes that we're concerned about. I'll just uh, highlight a few of these in this talk uh, before I, I turn the, the page to the climate action and health benefits from a low carbon economy. But look at you know how many climate sensitive uh, outcomes uh, we're concerned about. An obvious one is heat waves. You know, heat waves kill more people than all uh, weather uh, events combined, all other weather com events combined. Uh, this is a pretty stark image of, uh, of Texas and how hot uh, it will be. These are projections from the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. But we've actually uh, zoomed in a little bit on cities. Um, sorry, I don't have Houston, but I do have Dallas. And from our own analysis, um, Dallas, Texas will see more than a doubling in the number of days hotter than 100 degrees Fahrenheit uh, by mid-century. So we're only talking, you know, 20 to 30 years from now, a doubling in the, the number of days over 100 degrees in, in Dallas, Texas. We have already seen uh, some problems. Uh, I've never heard of a heat dome. I've been studying climate change and health for 25 years. I've never heard the expression a heat dome, which we had this summer, that is essentially a nationwide heat wave that lasts, you know, multiple days. I think it even lasted up to a week. So this is something we are already experiencing uh, today. This is not a far off problem. Climate change is affecting us now. Uh, and when I saw this happen and I thought about um, the, it was the expiration of the eviction ban, I wrote this op-ed about the triple threat, uh, COVID-19, climate change, and eviction. So they're going to be populations at high risk, um, disadvantaged populations that will especially suffer. So this year, uh, I've had more... Uh, medical students in my class, climate change and medicine, uh, talking about the, the uh, forest fires in the West, on the West Coast. Um, it's been uh, an unprecedented year for fires. And of course, with fires comes um, hazardous air quality. Uh, I need not remind you of some of these rankings, but just take a look at, uh, you know, these different standard rankings of uh, fine particle pollution and ingrain those colors in your mind when you look at uh, the cities. Now, this is actually from the fires of 2018. Uh, this year was even worse. But look at the air pollution uh, across the cities. Look how unhealthy uh, San Francisco was and, and Sacramento. Very dangerous. Uh, this year, I think that uh, at, at one point, San Francisco was the most polluted city in the world during these fires. So th there comes a risk of this uh, from these fires. And this is just to show the trend, you know, the increasing amount of um, acreage being burned. <clears throat> so <clears throat> this is focusing on the, um, you know, extreme uh, drought and heat. But um, there's the, the other side of the hydrologic extremes. And I, I do remember I was in a, a briefing uh, with, uh, it was actually with Bill Clinton and, and he's a smart guy. And he said, hey, you, you guys, how do you, how can you say we're gonna have droughts and heat waves? And at the same time, we're gonna have floods and um, you know, it just doesn't make sense. And it was, a, it was a good question. And the answer of course is that, you know, hot air um, evaporates soil moisture quickly and you get droughts, but hot air holds more moisture. And you are in Texas and you know that uh, more than most people in the country. So when you get very hot air, it holds more moisture. And 
this is a globally average projection from the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change showing that it's the heavy rainfall events that will be increasing <clears throat> in their frequency. So when it rains, it will pour. The, the number of events that are <clears throat> two inches or greater as far as the amount of precipitation, these will be increasing. <clears throat> what does that mean for health, though? Uh, we did a study, um, I'm sure you've all heard of uh, combined sewage overflow events, CSOs, and we looked at the, um, the prediction for what will the nature of rainfall be like? You know, how many more heavy rainfall events with uh, heavy rainfall and runoff and contamination? And we studied the Chicago uh, basin and found that that area could almost have a doubling or 50 to 120 percent increase. You know, somewhere up to upwards of a doubling in the number of these combined sewage overflow events where sewage systems simply can't handle the amount of uh, rainfall runoff and they will overflow. Some, many of these are by design that they overflow, um, but still it's a contamination of uh, surface waters. So that's a problem. And we've done studies in Wisconsin showing a, a increased risk in childhood gastrointestinal illness in the central part of Wisconsin uh, that has um, a lot of reliance on well water. Uh, 600,000 residents uh, in Wisconsin rely on well water. And um, you know this is, this is a risk to contamination events. So being in Houston, uh, you know better than I do uh, what happens when hurricanes hit. And if any of, uh, if there are any medical students or other health professional students in the audience, uh, I'd like to ask them if, the, if they think there's a strong correlation between these two lines, because the green line is the sea surface temperature in the Atlantic. And the blue line is the power dissipation index or the strength of winds, uh, hurricane winds. Now, what we don't know is the number of hurricanes that will make landfall. That's very complicated. And that is something that the climate scientists are, uh, will not uh, tell you. And it's hard to predict that. But just from the law of physics, and when you look at this graph, you recognize that when a hurricane forms and the water temperature is warmer, you get stronger uh, wind. You get a, a, a more powerful hurricane. And I know that in Texas, you're well aware when you see a hurricane coming and then you immediately start asking the question, what is the temperature of the surface waters in the Gulf of Mexico? And if they're high, you know that you're in trouble. And, you know, the hurricane season this year is uh, breaking records, um, you know, with the number of hurricanes. Um, and again, this is something that I need not tell you more about what the impacts are. But that, some surprises with hurricanes. Um, this is uh, from North Carolina, um, a hurricane that struck, Hurricane Floyd. And you can see the hog picture, this awful picture of the hogs that died, the hog farms, and then the lagoon waste and the water contamination all over the place. So emergency room uh, personnel were primed to be ready for, you know, waterborne diseases and diarrheal disease and, and water quality issues. But that's not what they saw in the ER. They actually saw asthma cases, you know, from people going back into their homes after flood events. And that this is um, very challenging, especially in uh, locations with poor housing. Um, you know, you, after general, after small floods, you see mold uh, and a repeating problem of mold and asthma, and especially in children. But after hurricanes, you know, something like this and this kind of uh, extreme exposure. Uh, this is not pretty. And 
this is a major uh, impact uh, that we don't think about when we think about hurricanes, but it's a big health impact. One other um, airborne uh, problem, uh, aside from molds, is increases in aero allergens. And there are studies that show that ragweed pollen increases, the production of ragweed pollen increases with higher temperatures and more CO2 in the atmosphere. And especially uh, places of higher latitude, we're seeing in Wisconsin, we're seeing a, a two-week increase in the length of our pollen season and ragweed pollen season. And since the 1950s, the Northern Hemisphere has increased by uh, increased CO2 by 27%, and Wisconsin is one degree Fahrenheit warmer. Wanting to shift gears um, to something that may be uh, important to southern states like Texas and Louisiana and Florida, um, insect-borne diseases or vector-borne diseases are especially sensitive to weather conditions. Um, and I ask my students usually, you know, what's the difference between us mammals and that mosquito on the screen besides the fact that we don't fly and we also don't suck blood? Um, or at least not, you know, most of us, I don't think suck blood. I usually I get a chuckle with that one. But anyway, you know, a big difference is we are warm blooded. Our body temperature is pretty much the same all the time, give or take a fever, but it's pretty much constant. That mosquito is, is cold blooded. So whatever the air temperature is surrounding that mosquito, that's its body temperature. And if she's carrying um, parasites, uh, or like malaria parasites or dengue fever virus. Uh, and in this case, this is a 80s Egypti mosquito and it carries uh, yellow fever, dengue fever and Zika virus. Dengue fever is the most uh, prevalent arbovirus in the world. But uh, Zika virus uh, is the same family of viruses as dengue carried by the same mosquito vector. So you would think that Zika would behave just like dengue, at least that, that's what I was telling my students up until uh, a couple of years ago. So let me just show you what happened with Zika. This is the El Nino event of two, the winter of 2015, 2016. It was tied with, in strength with the 1997-98 event. So tied with the strongest of recent event but lasting longer. So uh, even though climate scientists won't tell you this, I, I think that infers that this is the strongest El Nino we've had in history, but I mean, in recent history, but let's just call it one of the strongest uh, El Nino events. And look at the temperatures uh, across Brazil and Colombia. Um, my colleague, uh, climate scientist, Dan Vimount up here, um, showed that the, um, these temperatures were well above two standard deviations uh, above a 50-year constructed normal temperature for the region. So incredibly high temperatures right before Zika struck. So what's the evidence for a link between temperature and Zika? Well, this is looking at the vectoral capacity of that mosquito to transmit uh, dengue fever and Zika. Vectoral capacity, meaning that for every single case of illness, how many more cases will a single case lead to? And given the biology of that mosquito vector, uh, you can calculate vectorial capacity, um, you know, and it is very temperature dependent. And this is showing you've all with, uh, with the COVID-19, you have all been hearing about um, this uh, R naught, uh, this R naught value, the you know the rate of transmission, and right now you know like influenza, it's about an R naught of two, which means one case of flu brings you about two more cases of flu. Um, uh, the jury is out on what the real um, R naught for COVID is right now. I think it's somewhere between. Um, I won't, I, I have to check the latest. It's somewhere between, you know, three and three and four, I think. Um, but um, I'd have to check with uh, my epidemiologists that are on looking at that. But anyway, you know what R naught is. So 
Look at where R0 was the highest. It was right after those extremely hot El Nino temperatures. And this is the hottest, uh, the, the highest vectorial capacity or the likelihood or the conditions for that mosquito to transmit uh, dengue and Zika uh, during that winter. So it was the highest level in 60 years. But where I was wrong uh, in telling my students that Zika behaves exactly like dengue fever is that there are new lab studies that show that the Zika virus transmission, the optimal temperature of 29, point, uh, 29 degrees centigrade is a thermal minimum transmission that's five degrees warmer than the optimal transmission temperature for dengue. So it's possible. Zika is really complicated. You know, the international travel, and we think that it was the canoe races of the World Cup that brought the virus with, you know, in people's blood when they came to these canoe races or the World Cup, you know, it got onto the continent. It's a complicated story. But to the extent that, you know, you had abnormally hot temperatures and you see these laboratory studies that show that hot temperatures favor Zika transmission. Uh, I won't say it was everything, but certainly a probably a confounding problem that led to the Zika outbreak. Just like when West Nile virus, completely different family of viruses, a different mosquito, but when West Nile virus came to the United States, international travel, uh, maybe it was in, uh, infected mosquitoes uh, on the plane, we're not sure, but it, it landed in New York in uh, the summer of uh, uh, 1990, I'm sorry, uh, the summer of um, 2003, uh, I have to go back and look. The, the summer it arrived was, was the strongest, um, it was the hottest July ever recorded in New York. And the uh, U.S. strain that hit New York, um, I, I think it was actually 19... 99 that it came in and then it spread to the midwest 2002 and then by 2004 is on the west coast so it was 1999 i think it came in but anyway the conditions were very hot in new york city and so there's a question of did that actually have something to do with promoting west nile virus even though international travel was the big story with west nile so maybe we have something a little bit similar with uh, zika Zika virus as well. And you know that Aedes aegypti, uh, Texas, of course, is in the range of Aedes aegypti, definitely in the range of Aedes albopictus, the uh, Asian tiger mosquito. So something to keep an eye out for. Okay, so I want to shift gears. And, you know, now that you realize how climate change absolutely is a major health threat, you know, will we do something about climate change? You know, uh, people argue that the climate change crisis is a far bigger health challenge than COVID, although COVID is just overwhelming right now. You know, we will have a vaccine eventually. We will get through COVID. Now, the flip side is that there are going to be more pandemics like COVID if we don't take uh, land conservation seriously and stop uh, disrupting natural ecosystems and deforested, deforesting uh, the Earth's landscape and forcing bats to migrate and all sorts of havoc when we um, destabilize natural ecosystems. So that's another story in itself. That's a whole nother lecture. But just the current COVID pandemic, you know, uh, short of the vaccine, this has been very hard to go to lock, locking down the economy, the social distancing, and what it's what it's meaning, the hardships on on people. And so, after COVID is over, will people really be able to handle and confront another global crisis like climate change? Well, this is where the public health narrative is so important, because unlike COVID-19, personally, I think combating climate change could be free or even a net gain. 
look at look at a couple of sectors, for example. Um, and, um, and and just just quickly, I I've been on this soapbox for uh, six years now, talking about climate change challenges and opportunities. That solving the global climate crisis could be the greatest health opportunity of our times, and a low carbon future could improve global health and achieve economic benefits. So let's look at three sectors. So action on climate change, looking at the energy sector, well, air pollution kills 7 million people every year, uh, according to the Global Burden of Disease and the WHO. So obviously we know clean air will save lives. And in the food sector, you know, energy intensive diets, especially high meat diets, high meat, dairy, processed, um, starchy uh, grain, uh, food, um, these are problems not only for our health, but for the environment. And I'll show you some, some statistics. But according to this uh, major report out of the Lancet uh, Journal, the uh, Eat Lancet Commission report, you know, if we could get to a, a universal recommended diet to get away from some of these foods, uh, we could save 11 million deaths every year. And finally, um, over-reliance on motorized vehicles, uh, private motorized vehicles, leads to sedentary lifestyles. And estimates are that sedentary lifestyles um, uh, preclude physical activity and that 5 million people are dying prematurely because of sedentary lifestyles. Now, something very close to us now with COVID pandemic, a study out of Harvard um, showed that the comparing the top map, which is air pollution, with the bottom map of people dying from COVID, um, controlling for human population density and all sorts of other confounding factors that these, uh, you know, an excellent team of epidemiologists, I know the lead person, you know, they found that for, for just an increase of one microgram per cubic meter of fine particles, PM2.5, that is associated with an 8% increase in the risk of dying from COVID-19. That struck, that's striking. A tiny increase in fine particles increases the risk of dying from COVID. So that's another reason to do something about air pollution as well. But let's take a look at um, what we've seen from the shuttering of the global economy around the world in response to COVID. Look at these satellite maps uh, looking at nitrogen dioxide, which is easy to track by satellite. Um, here you have January of this year in China, a shut down the industry and look at the air quality, you know, a month later or two months later. Look at um, Europe, France and Germany, other parts of Europe. Um, on the left, you have uh, nitrogen dioxide pollution, March of last year and March of this year. Same thing in the United States. The top map is March of last year. And the bottom map is March of this year. And who would have ever thought that these mega cities in India would, would see air quality in the in the good range, you know, these green air quality images from India. So, you know, COVID-19 is very challenging and especially in poor countries, the, the lockdown on the economy is devastating. I just saw, I heard reports yesterday or the day before about other problems with uh, uh, the, these lockdowns and, and stopping other global health measures. Like for example, the polio eradication program is in serious jeopardy. We've almost eradicated polio. And yet right now with um, stopping the vaccinations and the problem with COVID and, and all the other vaccines not being delivered, we got, we've got some problems. Um, so, so anyway, that said, you know, here is one positive that um, we know air pollution kills but just a stark experiment before and after locking down the fossil fuel industry around the world, we see these amazing benefits. And remember, 7 million people die prematurely from air pollution around the world. 
are we seeing of, uh, effects right now? These are estimates. This just was published, I think, last uh, maybe three weeks ago. I think in the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, I'm not sure. Um, but already in China, we're seeing from the air quality benefits from locking down industry, uh, more than 24,000 lives saved, and in, in Europe, more than 2,000 lives saved. So air pollution kills, and you know, I know you've all seen these images in the newspaper. You know, what could be any clearer than the on the left, the before and after locking down, uh, sh shuttering the global economy that's mostly driven by fossil fuels and the number of lives that can be saved every year. So when you see pictures like this, I ask this question, you know, at this time, do we really want to uncork the current fossil fuel economy or get to a clean energy economy where everyone prospers? And I know that I, I I know that in Texas, I think wind energy is the fastest um, part of the energy sector right now in Texas. So Texas has a lot to gain. Of course, the oil industry that's going to be an issue, and oil companies I think need to transition to become energy companies. So there is urgency to this. Uh, we all know about Greta Thunberg from Sweden. This is in or Swedish sign, uh, School Strike for Climate, um, talking about the um, responsibility that leaders around the world need to take on this issue, stop talking about it and acting on it and really getting serious. You know, she's had major traction looking at, you know, telling the U.S. Congress to wake up and, you know, the future generation, you know, has their eyes on us to quit messing around and really get some action done. Where does this urgency come from? Um, well, after the Paris Agreement, which was a historical uh, agreement with more heads of states showing up at one place in, at one time uh, ever before, as ever before, uh, from the, the Paris Agreement of 2015, the world leaders asked the science body of the UN to at, to see what it would take to stabilize the world at two degrees warming, because all the impact scientists from across many multiple years of assessment for the IPCC have been saying, if you get above two degrees centigrade, things fall apart, ecosystems fall apart, crop yields go down majorly, you know, above two degrees centigrade, it's really serious. And if possible, you know, in, in Paris, they said, well, gosh, can we try to stay below one and a half degrees warming above industrial levels? So the scientists were asked to do that assessment. What, it, what would it take to get to one and a half degrees centigrade? And as I show you this shocking next fact, I'm going to take a sip here while you take this in. So to stabilize warming, to not go above one and a half degrees centigrade, we would have to cut emissions, primarily from burning fossil fuels, but also through um, uh, stopping the cutting of rainforests. We have to cut emissions 45% by the year 2030. So 10 years from now, we have to cut emissions almost in half and get to net carbon zero by 2030. So you know, calling this climate change is uh, is not a good idea anymore. It's a climate crisis. This is a pretty much a global emergency. Um, so this is really uh, this is really challenging, and it could be paralyzing when you think about how big a challenge this is, unless you start adding in the health benefits. So we know in the United States that people die from fine particle pollution from coal-fired power plants. You can see, you know, where this is most heavily felt. Uh, somewhere between 60 to 80,000 Americans die every year uh, from particulate air pollution. Um, there have been studies that show um, if you were to increase your renewable energy, these are um, RP, uh, these are renewable portfolio standards, uh, RPSs. So looking at, um, this is for some Rust Belt states. 
And if you look at the cost of that clean energy and compare it with climate benefits of, you know, less greenhouse warming and what it means for crops and for health and things in the future, but more importantly, focus on the immediate health benefit from clean air quality. That health benefit is more valuable, is worth more than the investment cost. So this is for a scenario of 13% renewables. What if you double that and got to 26% renewables in your energy portfolio? Well, higher costs, but much higher health benefits. And uh, this uh, study from last year showed that, you know, if you, you know, increase, well, that existing renewable portfolio standards in the Rust Belt generates health benefits of about $94 for every ton of CO2 avoided, so and not emitted by having cleaner energy. We've done a study like this in Wisconsin. This is looking at, uh, can we generate our own uh, power in Wisconsin instead of from the coal-fired power plants uh, in the Dakotas? And we can, number one, and it can be from mostly clean energy, mostly solar and wind, um, a little bit of hydro, keep nuclear constant at 4% and electric uh, have conservation and, and energy efficiency. So we can generate our electricity in the state, but because you are a health crowd and I'm a health scientist, I'm gonna ask, well, so what? You know, right? What does that mean for health? Well, this scenario, we would save about 2000 lives every year and we would have all of these other health benefits and this equates to uh, about $21 billion a year in air pollution health savings, as well as netting 162,000 new jobs. So even for people that don't buy climate change science and want to have nothing to do with climate change, it's a no-brainer. I mean, to go to clean energy, even if you don't believe in climate change, is an enormous health opportunity and economic opportunity. This is, this is the message. Uh, this is probably my most important message today is that, you know, climate change is absolutely a health issue. It's not just environment, it is a health issue. But solving the problem offers huge health benefits, enormous. And, uh, you know, there have been studies comparing the investment costs of clean energy. It might cost about $30 to avoid a ton of, of CO2 emission. But for every ton of CO2 that you avoid emitting from burning less coal and oil, you also don't emit the dangerous um, particulates, uh, PM2.5 and other harmful pollutants. And the reduction in PM2.5 on average globally would give you a $200 benefit for every ton avoided. Uh, in mortality reduction and in hospitalization reductions and also lost, uh, uh, lost labor. And I would ask the decision makers, which number is bigger? Most of them are focusing on $30 and they forget the largest part of the equation, which is the health side. And even bigger uh, uh, discrepancies in uh, these numbers when you go to other polluted areas like India and uh, Southeast Asia. However, you know, the $30 now is in question. Uh, a lot of people think that this is way overestimated. Look at the price of solar energy since the 70s. It's dropped 99%. And wind and solar have dropped, uh, even in the last five to seven years, have dropped tremendously in price. And this is a brand new report or brand new finding that if all subsidies were removed, so no subsidies for anything, that renewables plus batteries have become the cheapest way to generate electricity. This is the first time this has happened ever. So there's no reason to wait for a solution. It's already here. Another sector, um, I won't go deep into this uh, like I did with the energy sector, but just a quick um, heads up on this very important report that uh, all of the medical students should definitely be uh, have in their in their toolkit. This is um, the uh, Lancet Commission report, Food in the Anthropocene, 
uh, healthy diets from sustainable food systems. Um, I won't go into this in depth, but this figure from that report compares, um, you know, a universal healthy reference diet that all of you already know about, you know, more vegetables, fruits, whole grains, nuts, unsaturated uh, oils, moderate amount of seafood, very little um, meat, um, you know, low meat uh, and processed uh, uh, grains and starchy vegetables. So if you were to get to this universal healthy diet, everything in the shaded area, that's in excess, you know, way too much meat and starchy vegetables uh, and these other things. If we were to reduce these and get to the universal healthy diet and be in this area, guess what happens? Well, for one thing, you know, comparing across those different forms of um, food, you know, summing this up, you know, we look at the environmental impact, greenhouse gases, land use, energy use, acidification, eutrophication from fertilizer runoff, lots of environmental damages, especially from meat production and dairy. So <clears throat> what would happen if we were to get to the reference diet and have, you know, just a small amount of meat in our diet and increasing plant-based diets, you know, we would save about 11 million lives every year. And you'd have less damaging environmental effects of food production. So I want to spend my last couple of minutes on one last sector, and that is the transportation sector. And that you know, if you compare cities in the United States, those with the highest rates of walking and cycling to commute to work have obesity rates that are 20% lower and diabetes rates 23% lower compared to the cities with the lowest rates of active travel. And of course, you know that, you know, exercise reduces the risk of heart disease, cancer, dementia, and depression in addition to burning calories and reducing obesity and also reducing risk of diabetes, um, you know, exercise, we know how important that is for our health. So to design cities more for people than simply for um, fast traveling, private motorized vehicles, I mean, this is where we have a golden opportunity when you realize that you know, the majority of Americans do not even meet the recommended level of exercise. So golden opportunity here to, uh, to change our transportation system. We did a study uh, in our area um, looking at short car trips in, in our upper Midwest region, the 11 largest cities in the upper Midwest. If we were to take short car trips of two and a half miles off the road, there'd be an air quality benefit. If you turn half of those car trips, short, short car trips in cities, into bicycle trips, and only in the summertime, so four months of the year, half of those car trips, you'd have an increase in physical fitness. And save uh, combined, save 1,300 lives every year with $8 billion in health savings with that. So golden opportunities here as far as uh, fitness. And just a reminder that, as I said before, physical activity is more than just burning calories. There is a wealth of physiology studies, um, bottom line, that contracting muscles are factories of beneficial anti-cancer and cardiovascular disease chemicals and boosted immune system. Um, not bad when you're battling with COVID. So I conclude by asking the question, uh, and I saw this op-ed in, you know, on Grist, and I just think this image is, is so powerful. You know, when you think about how we are completely unifying around fighting the threat of COVID and just going at it with all, you know, all stops pulled out and full court press, you know, why don't we treat climate change like we're treating the COVID crisis? and treat it like an infectious disease because climate change is a global health crisis. And my concern is that, uh, and many as well, not just me, you know, feel that 
we need to take advantage of this opportunity when we realize how movement can happen in a big way. Um, we can right now, you know, with these uh, stimulus packages, you know, first priority is to beat the pandemic and invest in stopping this pandemic. But at the same time, you know, the last thing we want to do is get back to normal. You know, the the UN has talked about build back better before the Democratic campaign, you know, copy the exact same words. But that's true. I think we have a, an opportunity to really go uh, to build back better, to leapfrog, especially in our energy technology, uh, so we can combat the climate crisis. And um, I'll close by just summarizing that indeed climate change poses health risks, but climate action brings enormous health opportunities. Um, one of the most important things to do is to take this message, take this lecture and an abbreviated form of it and spread the word. It's really important that we talk about the climate crisis as a health issue and with a health opportunity. So, you know, a really first great important step is to take a pre-packaged, professionally done YouTube, you know, a TEDx that I did a couple of years ago. All you need to do is Google my name and TEDx and it'll pop up. And I encourage you to spread this 19-minute uh, version of what you just heard. Of course, I did it before the COVID pandemic, so you won't see the wildfire pictures and you won't see any mention of COVID. But uh, take this uh, TEDx talk spread it uh, to your networks and keep talking about climate change. And with that, um, I thank you uh, so much for uh, inviting me to give this uh, Stallone lecture. Um, it's really an honor and um, thank you very much. I will wrap it up there and stop sharing and give it back to you, uh, Bill. Okay, thank thank you so much, uh, Dr. Patz, for this really great uh, thought provoking and energizing discussion on the subject of climate change, or more appropriately named climate crisis. Um, I'm just going to mention that we've had a few questions come in uh, to the chat box, and if you if you have other questions, please feel free uh, to put your questions in there. And then at the end, we'll also maybe try to take a few minutes to uh, to ask some live questions. Um, I'll kind of start off a little bit uh, with with one question uh, for you, uh, and keeping in mind that in our in our audience we have got uh, school public health faculty, uh, staff, students, as well as uh, members of the community and, and other universities. Um, our our school of public health has got masters and PhD levels students in in areas of really diverse areas of epidemiology, infectious diseases, public policy, and behavioral sciences, and. I wonder, Dr. Patz, if you have any um, thoughts or, or insight, uh, especially in your role as, as an educator, as to how students uh, starting their careers might try to integrate uh, the subject of climate change into their careers, when, when oftentimes there's very little funding specifically addressed specifically for climate change, if you have any some broad thoughts on that. Sure. No, that's a great question. You know, there are the American Medical Association is very keen to increase the uh, curriculum in climate change. And there are other groups that are quite interested to see climate change brought into the medical school curriculum and in the schools of public health and in the schools of nursing and other allied health professionals. Um, you know, this is something that I tell health organizations, public health organizations that are just swamped with a full plate of issues, that climate change should not be viewed as an add-on issue. Like, I've got everything else to deal with. Just leave me alone. Don't tell me I've got to work with climate change. Because climate change is one of these um, threat multipliers. You've, you've heard that before, I'm sure. That, you know, it cuts across and it will take all of the issues that we're dealing with, be it heat waves, um, contaminated water systems, um, air quality, uh, for refugee health, you know, forced environmental uh, refugees, things like that. It will take all of these problems and exacerbate them. So I think that 
the topic of climate change, which we need to call the climate crisis, is really, it, it pervades across all of these health outcomes. And I think it needs to be woven into the curriculum. Now, in Wisconsin, uh, I teach a two-credit uh, medical elective, so it's an elective. But we have now required a one-hour for everyone, so there's at least going from zero to uh, 100% increase, but that's still only one hour. Um, frankly, I think, you know, I'd like to see a minimum of three to four hours because uh, there's so much to talk about. I have, in my two-credit course, I have 20 modules of material on why cli the climate crisis is absolutely a health uh, emergency and health opportunity. So I think um, there are there are more and more schools uh, that are bringing this in. There, uh, there's uh, at Columbia University. There's a climate and health curriculum program that's trying to do some uh, a clearinghouse of materials. So it is growing, and the demand is growing. I mean, my elective. It, it fills up in, in like no time every year. Um, well, we just started teaching it a year and a half ago, or a year ago, actually, now that I think about it. So, no, a year and a half ago. So um, it's there's huge demand. Um, I think students need to talk to their, uh, you know, the people that make decisions in the schools of public health and the medical schools and nursing schools. And just, you know, students have a lot of power and they, that generation is more concerned and it affects them more than it affects us, even though everything is now here, it's, it's still going to affect them. And I think, I think students should uh, mobilize and take, take their uh, sentiments uh, to the decision makers to ask for, to, to show that there are places that are bringing in more curriculum and to just uh, demand for it. Great, thank you, thank you so much. Um, I'm going to to pivot now to some of the uh, questions in the chat box, and I'll uh, I'll ask. This is for uh, the questions for uh, uh, any any one of the the Stallone's uh, kids who would who would like to answer. Uh, from Dr. Jimeno is a a couple of questions for Stoney's family. Many of us uh, may have parents or kids who are also in academics, and what would you tell to families? Uh, with such powerful figures like Stoney's? And then two, as a historian, have you planned to write Stoney's story? A basement full of memories, like you mentioned, seems quite an interesting place to start. So let me let me field that uh, first. Can you hear me all right? Great. Thanks for the questions. Uh, the second, the answer to the second question is, uh, I started a biography of him um, 20 years ago now. And Loran has, has helped uh, quite a bit. Uh, Jarrell has also helped. What I find is that um, it's a very difficult biography to finish because uh, the subject is so close. Uh, and so many of the stories that I thought I knew uh, turn out not to be historically accurate. Uh, so we hope to have the, the biography finished within the next two years. Um, but I've said that for quite a while. So anyway, uh, that's the story about the, the history and the biography. My advice about um, family, and I, I was typing this in the chat when uh, uh, Brett came back on. Um, I think it's important, and this is good advice for all parents. Um, I think it's important to uh, give student or give children a lot of distance uh, or a lot of uh, space, I mean, to allow them to develop independently, develop as their own people, to differentiate from parents when necessary. Um, for instance, when I was growing up, I was a swimmer. And at one point, dad said, uh, you know, you should, you should uh, earn a swimming scholarship to Yale like Don Scholander did. And so I thought, okay, that's what he wants. That's a great idea. I want to do that. And when I quit swimming at about 15 years old, uh, I felt like I had really disappointed. And I carried that sort of guilt and sense of disappointing dad um, for quite a while until we were watching the Olympics one summer together. 
And he turned to me and he said, you know, I'm really glad you quit swimming when you did. Those, those guys turn into muscular freaks, don't they? <laughs> so I carried that for a long time and I didn't need to. So allow uh, kids some space. Great. Well, thank you. Well, maybe some of the senior members of our faculty can help you with that book. So uh, not so close there. So thank you. Um, I'll ask a, another question uh, for Dr. Patz. Uh, is, uh, Dr. Patz, I'm wondering what role environmental injustice, especially environmental racism, plays in the climate crisis and how focusing on those issues might help us better address the crisis. Yeah, that's a great question and very timely. Um, you know, there there are going to be more vulnerable populations that are that are more affected by climate change. I, I mentioned poor housing, and you know, the issue of heat waves and um, you know air uh, air conditioning, um, but also flooding and mold in places with poor housing. Also, in a heat wave, you know, those that are most vulnerable are people that have. Um, heart disease, diabetes, so um, the uh, Native Americans uh, would risk um, in a heat wave. And so this is where there are, you know, vulnerable populations uh, to climate change. And when you saw Hurricane Katrina that hit New Orleans, you know, who, who was there? Who, who got out and who didn't? You know, that was an equity story that just was as stark as could be. Um, and if you go around the world, this is a little bit different, but around the world, you know, the populations least responsible for the problem, you know, the poor countries that are hardly emitting any emissions, they're the ones that are going to be uh, having the first impacts, you know, the small island countries and Bangladesh that will be completely flooded out. So there's an equity story internationally, but nationally, you know, uh, indigenous communities, um, um, communities of color, uh, these will be people that will be at more at risk, both from heat waves and from uh, flooding and disasters. Okay, thank you. Yes, definitely a lot of uh, a lot of challenges ahead. Um, yeah, and we have some comments. Is yeah, we've sort of had the same same issues here with with Hurricane Harvey. Uh, I think all of us that have been in Houston have had. Uh, a lot of experiences. Um, I might, while we're waiting on a few other questions to come into the chat room, I had another question that actually might be applicable to, to both you, Dr. Patz, as well as uh, 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 our Dr. Stallones. I know Dr. Loran Stallones has got an interest in climate change and your, your background in education, uh, Dr. Jared Stallone. So this is really a question on mobilization for to, to mitigate the effects of carbon of, of climate change really requires a lot of mobilization of resources and to do that a really educated public and I wonder how you all see uh, the role of, of, of medical the healthcare system as as educating the public uh, on the effects of climate change if there is a is there a, if the, is there a more direct role that healthcare providers healthcare systems, uh, quality assurance can have on educating the public to make us make them aware of the kind of these impending changes that that really do require a change in attitudes. If there's any thoughts, uh, I'll sort of open that up to you. Yeah. So um, if I can go first, Jared, uh, Brett, I will. Um, I'm going to be chan channeling communication science uh, that is very um, very detailed on communicating climate change. This is uh, run out of the uh, Yale, Yale University and George Mason uh, University. They have a Center for Climate Change Communication. They've been doing a survey of attitudes in America uh, for, I think, 12 or 13 years. It's called the Six Americas. There is a scale of six different attitudes from complete denial to extreme concern. And number one, the attitudes are changing across the landscape of America. More people are concerned and alarmed about climate change, number one. But to answer your question, Brett, the most trusted messengers of, for any communities in the United States are nurses, number one, and doctors, number two. 
I think I think 93% of people trust nurses, 91% trust doctors, it drops down to the 80s for scientists, and then it drops way down for everything else. So doctors and nurses are the most trusted messengers. And to the extent that there are you know, large health communities now that recognize the threat of climate change as real and urgent. You know, many health communities are coming on board <clears throat> and they are the effective messengers. So that's that's the key message. I'm just telling you the <clears throat> the communication science. That's great. Yeah, thank you. Um, any anything to add, uh, Dr. Sloan? I don't want to uh, uh, interfere with anything Loran might want to say on this subject, except to uh, mention the need for uh, critical thinking skills in the schools from pre-kindergarten all the way through university education. Um, we developed uh, the Common Core State Standards some years ago that really focused on developing critical thinking, um, media literacy, uh, the ability to uh, sniff out fake news from real news, um, because there's so much misinformation, particularly on uh, health and climate change issues. Um, so critical thinking is essential. We haven't gotten there yet. Um, you know, in education history, in a sense, that's what public schools were created to do, uh, was develop good citizens. And those uh, people have to be thinking citizens. So um, I think uh, colleges of education need to work across campuses with colleges of public health, engineering, architecture, uh, all of those uh, institutions so that we can create robust curricula uh, and help our teachers learn how to uh, help their learn to think a little bit more insightfully on the things they hear and see. Thank you. Thank you for that. Yeah, it's great. Great, great perspective coming from sort of the education background. So and, the one I'd like to contribute to this is um, I think one of the things that doesn't happen in education um, at the at the upper levels is more interdisciplinary education, much like Jared was saying, but I think one of the areas where we can pursue this is, is through uh, the lens of the One Health um, perspective, where if we are educating physicians to understand some of the zoonotic diseases um, through the lens of a veterinarian, we may do a much better job. And I, I do want to say that one of the proponents of this was an early faculty member at, um, at the University of Texas School of Public Health, and that was James Steele. So his legacy should be um, embraced and supported um, moving forward. And I think that gives the lens for climate change, uh, climate crisis conversation. But I also think the colleges of agriculture got to be engaged in this because there has to be a shift in our perspective about how we're going to deal with our food systems. And I think COVID does provide at least some por portion of an ability to start um, looking at right that we're going to be facing with. Lauren, that's a, that's a great point. If I can just add that, you know, absolutely um, a One Health perspective, a planetary health perspective, and what WHO has been pushing for a long time, a health in all policies perspective for, you know, recognizing that the healthcare sector is one thing, but food, energy, transportation, urban planning, these are hugely important, I would argue more important, you know, factors in determining population-wide health. So um, this is where health professionals need to really engage with the veterinarians, people in agriculture, and in ur with urban planners too. They really need to, to have a true, true health system and not just a, a health care system. Thanks for that. It really is a holistic approach um, uh, towards solving this problem. So really a lot of ideas. Um, I have a question from Dr. Otto, uh, a question to Stallone's family, Dr. Patz. Uh, uh, Dr. Stallone's had a large impact on public health in Houston through his personal journey and embracing the opportunities that matched his interest 
and change. What are your thoughts on the roles of individuals following different paths on perhaps helping society face the challenges of current times? Well, as Jared and I were um, interviewing people and thinking about the book, one of the things that um, dawned on me um, it are the wide variety of, of paths that the graduates of that particular school at that moment in time took. I'm sitting in a department of psychology. I came to Colorado State University in a department of environmental health in a, where there was no school of public health. There are a number of people who are from that same time period who ended up in departments of political science. So I think that there are multiple paths to making the impact that you want, even if your lens is a public health. You do not have to stay within the confines. And I think that's where we're going to get more of the interdisciplinary um, incorporation of our thinking into other programs. And um, I, I'm, I'm teaching health psychology right now. And it's been a fascinating thing watching the students navigate their recognition that while we understand a lot of things that impact people's behavior, we really don't know how to change it in a positive way. So, and, and that's where I think what Jared said is so important. It's the critical thinking and it's the ability to, to sort through, to pick out the, the path that you're passionate about and where you can make your contribution. It doesn't have to be um, this step um, linear path. And I think that dad's um, experience in life was very much that way. And I hope that we'll be able to do that more and more. Thank you. I appreciate it. Any other comments from our panelists? Lauren, didn't we have uh, some graduates who uh, have held public office, city council in Houston, maybe? Not just city council, but also um, national legislators and stuff. I, you know, you have to, you, it, it's, it's the health, it's health in all policies. You have to understand policy. And right now we're working with the city of Fort Collins to address um, actual development of certain areas um, to see if we can get health incorporated into thinking about developments, not just for housing, but also for commercial. That again, to me, is where the One Health platform gives us more opportunity than we've actually um, had in the past. But it does cut, cut across. You have to know urban understand what's going on with population movements. If our, if our communities are moving into cities, we have to make sure those cities are being healthful. Great, thank you. Thank you so much. Yes, I mean, I can't think of one other subject that requires more integration than, than in the area of climate change. And it really does require a, a group effort and breaking silos. Um, I have, have another question up here, it says, I really appreciate that Dr. Patz brought in the eviction crisis as one of the triple threats alongside COVID and the climate crisis. What do you see as the role for the medical field in addressing the housing crisis in the wake of both COVID and the widening gaps in wages? Well, I, I will give a fairly generic statement to say that to the extent that we recognize these other non-traditional health um, health problems as really directly related to health, we need to um, put forward that recognition and put forward the fact that these communities are at very high risk and, you know, you want to intervene uh, as early as possible. You know, the further upstream in the problem you can intervene, the better off and the more lives can be affected in a positive way. So I think um, with evictions and with recognition of worsening heat waves and flooding and that added risk. It's one of these areas that I think uh, is uh, ripe for public health professionals to step into to begin advocating to say, hey, this is a matter of life and death. This is a matter of hospitalization. This is a matter of children with asthma. Um, we need to have uh, safe, affordable, healthy housing as a public health intervention. So I think it's an area that should be expanded upon. 
Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm going to, we probably have time for just, I want to be respectful of our speaker's time. So probably one more question. If anybody wanted to uh, unmute and ask a question, um, now would be the time. And then I have a few you know, closing remarks. Okay. I'll go ahead and, and, and we'll stop here. I, I wanted to mention uh, that our own school of public health uh, last summer, Dr. Stephen Kelder taught a, a 1 hour class on, on climate change uh, and that uh, we're currently a group of us are, are getting together to, to, to develop that into a more uh, elaborate class. And, and really at the school, we have got so many uh, people with areas of expertise in some of these areas that we've been talking about today. So. Uh, more stay tuned if you're on the in the audience and you're interested in participating in that. If you're 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 on the faculty or are a member of the audience and would like to learn more, you know, don't hesitate to uh, to contact me uh, or or through through Londa. Uh, we would love to uh, to get you involved. I think series lecture series like this that really kind of break down silos, um, kind of get our thoughts. I know it's it's been very stimulating to me just to hear from other people's. Opinions and the Stallone's backgrounds and Dr. Pats's. So I really do appreciate every everyone's time, and uh, I, I think this is a great this was a great activity. Is any of my other panelists, uh, Dr. Dufresne or Dr. Otto, if y'all have anything else to add, um, or any of our panelists for closing remarks? No, this is Dave. I would just like to express my appreciation to everyone who participated on this. It's great presentations and great discussion. Okay, well, I'll close there. Please stay tuned. We're uh, scheduling, Tinnifly's got scheduled for the spring, a, another Stallone's uh, series lectures. And uh, like I say, if you have any interest, please don't hesitate to contact us. Uh, this is more to come. And thank you so much for your attention. And thank you to all the panelists today. We really appreciate it. Thank you, Brett. Okay. Have a good day, everybody.